In this episode, neuroscience professor Dr. Matthew Tata observes how to talk to your robot using cognitive neuroscience to make robots that can hear. We should be able to communicate our goals to robotic systems in the same way that we interact with other people. We should be able to talk to robots. However, there's a significant problem. Most robots can't hear. In this talk, Dr. Tata will explore how we solve some of the problems that face all hearing systems, whether biological or machine. Hello, thank you and welcome. Uh, I'd like to start my talk. And so in my talk today, I'll, I'll talk about robots and I'll talk about human perception, especially hearing, a little bit of vision. Uh, but I'd like to start my talk today with the imagination of the ancient Greeks. So 3,000 years ago, in Greek mythology, we find uh, the god Hephaestus. Hephaestus was the god of smiths and metalworking. And uh, in, in most descriptions of Hephaestus, he's described as lame. He had something wrong with his leg. He wasn't able to get around. And so, I mean, being a god, he could have sort of just magically had things work well for him, right? Or he could have had magical unicorns that would help him out or something. But instead, what he did is that, being the god of smiths, he built machines that would help him. He built these, among other things, he built these autonomous tables that would drive around and deliver things for him, help him out in his workshop. So a few things that I really like about this story, um, he could have done all sorts of other things. I mean, the imagination of the ancient Greeks could have included him having animals to help him or having him levitate things around, but instead, he built machines, machines. So even in the, the imagination of the ancient Greeks, there is this notion that someday there might be machines that are helpful, machines that can sort of autonomously move around, take care of tasks for people, especially for people who can't do those tasks well on their own. So I think that's really a, a, a fascinating kind of prelude to modern automation and robotics. But I want to pose this question that's sort of kind of the, the preface for the whole talk, and that is, how did the tables know what to do? The Hephaestus needed them to do specific tasks, and as far as I can tell, the, the mythology is sort of kind of oblique about this. They, they maybe just sort of magically knew what to do, or maybe he told them what to do, or I, he pulled out his iPhone and like, like, texted them or something. I'm not quite sure how the tables knew what to do. Of course, now we can fast, fast forward to modern times and we have all sorts of autonomous, uh, quasi-intelligent machines that help us out with things around our house, around the workplace. Uh, and it's not good enough that they just magically know what to do. I mean, it would be great if they just magically knew what to do. But in instead, what we have to be able to do is communicate our intentions, our goals to those machines. So this talk is about how we do that. So as I mentioned, we, we, have, uh, we have now the, the notion, the modern notion of, of robotics. And robots are actually quite common in our world, although they take forms that we might not recognize as robots. If I say the word robot, it conjures in your mind some particular idea, some form, and then you might think, oh, but also there's this other thing that's a robot, and there's this other thing that's a robot. What actually really is a robot? Here's some examples that you might call a robot. There's industrial robots. So industrial robots uh, can make precision welds, for example, or they can pick up heavy things, move them around. They're very assistive in the workplace. Uh, there's, now there's agricultural robots that can plow fields and harvest and mow your lawn for you. Where you might, you're most likely to interact with robots, and you might not realize it, is um, with autonomous vehicles. So we all know about self-driving cars, right? Teslas and Google cars and Uber cars and, and whatever. And you'll have a self-driving car maybe someday. Uh, but what's interesting is that actually you probably already do. Modern cars now are really robots. So you're usually in control of your car, but you'll notice actually, especially if you go around a corner too fast when it's snowy or slippery and you lose traction, the car, the computer in the car will intervene. It will modulate the braking and the throttle and get the car back under control. For a split second, 
that car is a robot and you're just a passenger. The car has taken over control. So you already have a robot. You might have two sitting in your garage right now. You're probably going to drive one home. The kind of robots that I work with, uh, I think are the most interesting, but they're also the most futuristic, are um, humanoid assistive robots. Humanoid just means that they more or less take the shape of a, of a human. Assistive means they're meant to help us out in our daily lives. So I'll, uh, I'll be telling you a lot more about this robot. This is the iCub, and I'll show you some videos of iCub. This is the one that we work with uh, in collaboration with uh, colleagues in Italy. Okay, so I've been, I've been using this word robot. Robot, but what is a robot? We need a sort of operational definition of a robot. And unfortunately, there isn't really a good one, or maybe fortunately, there isn't really a good definition of what is a robot. It's sort of whatever a robot means to you. But I'll tell you what robot means to me. A robot is a machine with sensors and motors or, or actuators that can do stuff in the world. But importantly, there's some kind of software that makes decisions. So it maps the sensor inputs onto motor outputs. It figures out what's happening in the world and it takes actions in its world. And that should sound familiar to you. That's exactly what your brain does. You take information from your sensory systems and you do motor actions with your motor system and your brain is the software that kind of glues those two things together. So that's what a robot is, at least in my mind. What is not a robot? So that definition actually excludes a number of things that you might kind of conjure up in your mind as that's a robot. Um, and I would say probably they're not robots. So first of all, smartphones. Smartphones are packed with sensors and they may have some fancy artificial intelligence that can do things for you digitally, but they don't do anything to the world. They don't have motors, they don't have grippers, they don't actually do anything around them. So they're not robots, no matter how smart a phone might be. Uh, a, a remote control, anything remote control, that might have sensors and it might have motors, but there's a human in the loop doing the decision making. That's not a robot. That's just like an RC car or something else, right? So that's not a robot. Um, you have sensors all around you, even your thermostat, that's a kind of a, a sensor. Of, of all of these things here, the thermostat most fits the definition of a robot. Why? Because it's a sensor and it triggers a motor, the, the motor in your furnace, right? And it decides whether to be on or off. So of those three things there, I'd pick the thermostat as the most robot-like rather than the the phone or the remote control UAV, right? Okay, so we've talked about what is a robot, what is not a robot. It doesn't really matter what your definition of a robot is. What matters is that robots exist to perform tasks for humans. That's the only thing that they're for. And the fact that we need robots to be performing these tasks for us has spawned an entire field of robotics called human-robot interaction, which aims to communicate goals and instructions to robots so that they can perform those tasks as efficiently as possible and so that we don't have to struggle with the robots. Because the last thing you, have to do, you want to have to do is fight with your robot to get it to do something, right? It should just do things on its own. Okay, so I want to talk about this field of human-robot interaction a little bit, because this is the field that, that I've been working in as an extension of my cognitive neuroscience research. In human-robot interaction, there's, there's a couple of really important concepts. They're kind of like um, the goals of human-robot interaction, and they're the hardest problems in the field of human-robot interaction. They're the problems of affordances and awareness. An affordance is just some feature of an object that lets you interact with it. So the handle on a cup, for example, is an affordance, or a doorknob is an affordance. It lets you reach out, grab it, interact with it, right? So a fundamental principle of human-robot interaction is that robots should be designed around affordances that are meant for people. You shouldn't have to redesign your kitchen or your car or your workplace 
so that it's easy for a robot. It should always be for you, and robots should have to just deal with that. Right? <laughs> so that's an important principle. And there's a, a good example, um, an anecdote of how, that, how important that is. So um, after the, uh, the tsunami in Japan, there was a, uh, the reactor meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear reactor. And Japan is like a powerhouse in uh, robotics. Like some of the most sophisticated robots are happening in Japan. The problem happened, that, uh, there were parts of the, the reactor area that were too, too radioactive and so people couldn't go in there. So of course they wanted to send robots in. But the radiation was damaging the communication systems of the robots and so they had to be shielded from radiation. That meant that they had to be fully autonomous. They couldn't be remote controlled. So they, they would send robots in, and all the robots had to do were simple tasks like turn a valve, press a button, move some things out of the way. But these robots couldn't do that. Those tasks are super easy for us because those affordances were designed for our hands and our bodies. But those robots weren't designed in a humanoid sort of way that allowed them to interact with our world. And so it turned out the robots were pretty well useless in, in that disaster. That spawned a whole field, subfield of robotics now called disaster recovery robots. Uh, it was sort of um, instigated by a DARPA challenge and they had t different teams com competing to build the best disaster recovery robots and they had to do simple tasks like open a door, um, use a screwdriver, drive a golf cart, Right? And they just failed miserably. It's still, this is a super hard problem to get robots that can interact with the human-built world. So that's the first important principle of human-robot interaction. The second important principle of human-robot interaction is something that people call context awareness. Context awareness. Let me start by unpacking that word awareness. We use the word awareness in robotics a lot. And it means something very different than it means when we use it in the, in the field of psychology or cognitive neuroscience, for example. Robots are just machines. They execute programs and they're not aware in any sense of what we would think of as aware. When we say a robot is aware, we mean a very specific thing. We mean that the robot behaves it takes actions in a way that's appropriate for its context. So for example, if you're in a kitchen and your assistive robot hands you uh, a soup spoon because it can tell that you need to stir something, that's it being context aware. Or if your robot moves out of the way because there's something coming, that's it being context aware. It's not conscious of what it's doing, it's a machine. But it behaves as if it's aware. And I can tell you, having worked with some robots that exhibit really good context awareness, it's remarkably difficult to not ascribe awareness, conscious awareness, to the robot. When a robot turns and looks at you and makes eye contact, it's like, ooh, th that's a person in there, but it's not. He, and I can tell you, even if you wrote the software that makes it turn and look at you, you still think it's, a, it's aware. That's just us, right? That, that, that's us ascribing that to the, to the robot. The robot isn't, isn't actually aware. When this, uh, this idea of, a f of uh, context awareness goes wrong, terrible things can happen. And a very good example of that happened in 2015 when a worker was killed at a Volkswagen factory in Germany. And what happened in this case was that uh, there were two workers who were installing industrial robots. And these industrial robots, they're not like what you might think of as a robot. They're nothing like an interactive robot. They're not supposed to be turned on when there's a person nearby. They shouldn't move at all. They're very, very strong and they're very dangerous. And what happened was one of the workers turned the robot on. And the way these robots work, in a very real sense, they're not actually robots because they don't really have software that makes decisions. It's certainly not context aware. It's just programmed to move its arm from this point to this point and have it help you if you're in the way because it's not going to stop. And that's what happened. The robot was turned on and it moved its arm and it crushed a person. Of course, the headlines read 
much more, in a much more sensational way, right? They make it sound like the robot intentionally grabbed the person and threw him to the ground and kicked him. And that's not what happened. It's a tragic event, but it was not what was reported in the media. In fact, th those robots did not have any awareness of the context. If they had awareness of the context, they wouldn't have moved at all. In this case, these robots were not smart enough. They were too stupid to be safe. So what we try to do in the field of human-robot interaction is to create robots that are at least aware of their surroundings enough to be safe, to be able to interact with people in, in a manner that's expected, predictable, and safe. Okay, so there's lots of different um, ways that we can create robots that are context aware, that work with the affordances of the world. What I'm most interested in is the use of sound, auditory perception. Because how are we aware of the context around us? Well, sound matters a lot for us. It's, very, it's sometimes subtle, but it's super important. We use sound, of course, we use sound to communicate with each other through speech, right? But we also are aware of all sorts of other sounds in our environment that tell us something about what's going on out there in the world. Things make alarms, things whistle at us, and we can tell when a car drives by. We use sound to interact with things, therefore sound is an affordance. And we use sound to glean information about the context that we're in. That's context awareness. So sound is super important. And it's so important that we spend billions of dollars on uh, hearing aids, for example. We've invented neuroelectric stimulators that, that can be implanted directly into the nervous system. We even learn to talk with our hands if we can't use sound. So sound is, is super important. And you can probably tell where I'm going with this. Of course, we should be able to use sound in robotics, right? Robots should exhibit auditory awareness. We should be able to talk to our robots and tell them what to do. But there's one big problem with that. Most robots can't hear. And they can't hear for a very good reason. Uh, sound perception, auditory perception, is computationally very, very challenging. We still haven't cracked those problems. We don't know how the human brain hears. How could we program a robot to be able to hear? The work that I do in my lab is mainly on auditory perception, but recognizing this problem of human, of human robot interaction and the limitations of a robot that can't hear, I decided to sort of port some of my research on human hearing into the field of robotics to see if there's something that we could help with, to maybe inspire some algorithms and some other software techniques that would allow roboticists to create robots that can hear. And I'm going to tell you about that research today. Okay, to understand why sound is, is such a difficult problem, we have to understand something about the nature of sound itself. I want you to imagine the air around you as sort of like an ocean. You're, you're sort of swimming in this sea of air. Sound waves are just ripples in that ocean. They're ripples of pressure. Anything that vibrates will send out those sound pressure ripples and they travel away from the vibrating thing how fast do they go it's not a trick question the speed of sound right that's sound so the the ripples travel away from the vibrating thing at the speed of sound they propagate through the air and they reach your ear anything that vibrates will make sound you might not hear it it might be too low of a frequency for you to hear or too high of a frequency for you to hear but that's what sound is, just ripples in air. An important concept about sound that's gonna matter later on uh, in this talk is that sounds can be composed of more than one frequency. So something that's vibrating very slowly has a low frequency sound. Something that's vibrating very fast has a high frequency sound. People can hear between roughly 20 hertz, that's 20 vibrations per second, and if you're like, 15 years old and really healthy, you can hear up to about 20,000 hertz, 20,000 vibrations per second. Once you hit my age, you can hear up to about 12 or 15,000 hertz. And then it just sort of gets worse. 
Um, okay. Uh, sound, so, so sound sources can, can be composed of different frequencies. Things can vibrate at more than one frequency at the same time. And I'll give you an example. The, the metaphor that I use to teach this with my undergraduates is the duck on a swimming pool. So I want you to picture a duck floating on a swimming pool. So of course, the swimming pool has some, some ripples in it, right? And so we could actually look at the movement of the duck on the pool. We could, we could plot its sort of height this way on a y-axis, and we could plot time on, on an x-axis, and so the duck would kind of move like this, right? right? It would make a sort of a wave like this. Okay, so that would be like one frequency, right? But what if I told you that the duck is in the pool, but the pool is on the deck of a cruise ship, and the cruise ship is in some heavy seas? So the whole cruise ship is going up and down, but of course it's going up and down more slowly than the ripples on the pool, right? So actually, if we were to plot the movement of this duck, it's doing the pool movement, but it's also doing this low frequency thing that's associated with, with the movement of the deck of the ship, right? And of course, the ship being on the ocean twice a day, it rises and falls with the tides. So there's a yet a third, much lower frequency that describes how this duck is moving. So the duck is actually moving in quite a complicated sort of way, right? Its movement is composed of three different frequencies all happening at once. We call that a superposition of frequencies. Sound waves work like that. So something is vibrating, it can be vibrating at different frequencies. If you've got two different things vibrating, they're sending out sounds that have different frequencies. And it turns out that those differences matter a lot for how we perceive sound, and I'm going to tell you about that. Okay, so we're talking about sound a lot. It's time to look at sound. Sound isn't something that you can easily visualize, and I'm going to show you three different ways that we can visualize sound, three sort of pr progressively more complicated ways that we visualize sound. The first is to kind of do what we said about the duck. We can just plot the ripples in height and time on the x-axis like this, and this is what you see. So you're not seeing the individual sound waves in this picture because they're, too, they're packed too closely together. But you do see that sound is comprised of kind of bursts of things. Can you tell what that is? No, of course you can't tell what that is. <laughs> but I'll play it for you and then your brain will figure it out right away. <laughs> when I was working on this slide a couple nights ago, I was working in my kitchen and my dog went bonkers because it was like, there's a dog in the house somewhere, but I can't see it, right? Okay, here's another sound. It's a more complicated sound, but it works the same way. Still ripples of air. Whistle, that's cool. Just notice the whistle. Here's the third sound. This is kind of more usual. <laughs> this is a mixture of sounds. Children playing on a playground. <laughs> and of course, the most important sound for us and for robots is human speech. In natural settings, sounds emanating from different sources mix and interfere before they reach the ears of a listener. Okay, so that's, that's human speech. There's two really big problems with perceiving that, especially perceiving that in real world settings, like in a crowded restaurant or walking down the street. And I'm going to tell you about those two problems and how we think the brain solves those problems and how we're starting to write software for robots so that it can, the robots can solve problems in the same way. Those two problems are called the segmentation problem and the cocktail party problem, or as my students like to call it, the busy bar problem, because nobody has cocktail parties anymore. To understand these, these problems, to get some intuition about why they're problems, I actually need to take you away from sound for a moment. 
because I want you to have some intuition about how sound works, but we need to use a sense that we have much better intuition with already, and that's vision. So I want to talk to you a little bit about visual perception, just for a moment, and then we'll come back to sound. The visual world is comprised of objects. Your brain likes to bundle things up into objects. What makes something an object? Well, an object is something that has a surface that's distinct from the background. Therefore, there's some boundary, there's an edge, a discontinuity between the surface of the object and the background behind it, or maybe some other object. You can't see through visual objects. They're opaque, usually, so, so they occlude. So where one object stops and the other object starts is easy to find. It's that edge. It's where the discontinuity is. And we can have discontinuities in all sorts of different kinds of features. So an object can be defined by its color, like the boundary between its colored surface and the color of the background. Right? Or it can be defined by lightness and darkness. Like the, the just the black and white contrast can define the edge of an object. Or it can even be defined by motion. An um, object moving against a stationary ba background pops out at you, and you, see, you instantly see that that's a, a distinct object. OK, so the notion of an object with a surface and edges is pretty intuitive in the visual world. But what is an object in the auditory world? What is a sound object? What are its edges? What are its surfaces? In order to be able to write software that can understand sound, we need to be able to figure that problem out. So we need to try to understand how the auditory system finds the edges and the surfaces of sound. It's not so simple because sounds mix together in the air as they propagate to you. We'll talk about that sort of in depth in a minute. Okay, so the two problems that, that we face then are trying to figure out where sounds stop and start, what, what sounds go with one object, what sounds go with another object, and how do you unmix them from their surroundings? So that first problem, the segmentation problem, is a problem specific to speech perception, and it's a little counterintuitive. Um, it arises because speech is not what it sounds like. When we listen to speech, what we hear, or we think we hear, is a sort of discrete stream of words, each word separated from the next, with a sort of perceptual gap in between. It's nice and segmented, and we, we don't get the words confused, at least, at least if we're listening to a language that we're very familiar with. If you've ever tried to learn a second language, especially later in life, you quickly discover the segmentation problem. The segmentation problem is that experience you have of not being able to make sense of where one word starts and stops and where the next word starts or stops. The syllables blend together, the words blend together. That's your brain failing to solve the segmentation problem in a language that it doesn't understand. So the, the computational problem of this segmentation problem is that you can't just look at the waveform and figure out where the words are. There's bursts, for sure, and those bursts tend to correspond not with words, but with syllables. The words are actually kind of an illusion. Your brain puts syllables together and compartmentalizes them into words, but there aren't actually words in the sound itself. And if you actually try to draw a line, stop the video where you think the word boundaries ought to be, which I tried to do, you end up with something that doesn't really work at all. In natural settings, sounds emanating from different sources mix and interfere before they reach the ears of a listener. Doesn't make any sense, right? Th that's the segmentation problem. It's not easy to draw lines where words start and stop, but your brain can do it just fine. Your brain can do it just fine as long as you're listening to a language that you're familiar with. Okay, so that's the segmentation problem. And the second problem 
is this thing called the cocktail party problem. And that's something you're very familiar with. Uh, imagine you're in a crowded restaurant, a busy bar, a cocktail party, and you have to focus your auditory selective attention on one voice. You can easily select that voice, usually easily select that voice out of a crowded space, uh, ignoring all of the distractors. But computationally, that's a really difficult problem because, as I said, all of those sounds mix together in the air. So your brain has to be able to unmix those, those sounds. Uh, if we look at a mixture of sounds, it, we see the, the problem in natural Start. settings, sounds emanating from different sources mix and interfere before they reach the ears of a listener. Now it's virtually impossible to put lines around where the speech starts and stops, right? When we have an actual mixture of sounds. But the brain does it. The brain does it. We want to write software that can do it, so we have to understand how the brain can do it. Okay, so to understand the auditory world, the brain has to solve the segmentation problem and the cocktail party problem. How does it do that? Um, if I give you the task of unmixing some stuff, let's say I give you a big handful of change and I say, okay, unmix this pile. What you're probably going to do is spread it out on a table and make distinct piles, right? You'll put the nickels over here and the dimes here and the quarters over here and maybe you've still got pennies and you put them in a separate pile. What you're doing in that case is you're separating all of the components using space as a dimension to separate things. You're spreading them out in space. The auditory system can do that too. It's actually got three dimensions that it uses to separate things out. It has the dimension of frequency, it has the dimension of space, and importantly, it has the dimension of time. And each of those three different ways to separate the auditory scene gets computed by a different stage of processing in the auditory system. And I'm going to take you kind of through the auditory system and talk about how these different structures work. The auditory system is, of course, very complex, and there's a dozen or more different parts of the auditory system. And I've given you the very, very simple sort of diagram here. At the level of the, of the ear itself, that's where the frequency decomposition step happens. And that happens first. It happens independently in the two ears. Uh, then the spatial decomposition happens in the brainstem and midbrain. And the temporal decomposition, we think, happens in the cortex. Let's kind of zoom into these and, and look at... Uh, l let's look at these and we'll actually we'll look at sound the way these different structures can see sound. So we saw it already as like a sort of waveform, but now we want to actually visualize the sort of auditory image that each of these structures computes and then feeds forward to the next structure. In the, uh, the inner ear, there's a structure called the cochlea. You may have heard of it. It's, it, it's the cochlea that you hear in cochlear implant. The cochlea is actually a tube of bone that's sort of wrapped up like a snail shell. That's why it's called a cochlea. It's filled with fluid, and inside that tube is something called the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane is this tissue that vibrates when sound comes in, and it, it vibrates in a very specific, interesting way. It's thicker on one end and thinner on the other end. So picture like the strings of your piano. Maybe you don't have a piano. Picture the strings of a piano. The thicker, longer strings vibrate more slowly, and they make a lower pitch, right? And the, the, the shorter, tinier strings vibrate more quickly, and they make a higher pitch. And all the intermediate strings are kind of in between that, right? The basilar membrane is exactly the same way. So the thicker end vibrates in response to low frequencies. The thin end vibrates in response to high frequencies, and then it sort of maps out all the different frequencies in between. So when sound waves come in, they actually, depending on their frequency, they activate different parts of the basilar membrane. And if those sound waves change frequency, the activation moves along the basilar membrane. We can visualize that now if we add a dimension to our picture. So we've still got time on the x-axis. Instead of amplitude on the y-axis, we'll use color 
to describe amplitude. So the brighter the color, the louder the sound. So now we've got a third axis, that's frequency. Different sounds of different frequencies will kind of map onto this picture in different places. This is called a spectrogram, and we can listen to sounds and visualize sounds using a spectrogram. It's not just a pretty picture, that's actually a depiction of where the activation is on the basilar membrane as that sound sweeps from a low frequency to a high frequency. The activation actually moves along the basilar membrane. You can think of the basilar membrane then kind of like a prism for sound. A prism takes white light and sort of explodes it out into the colors of the rainbow, the whole spectrum. Those colors are different because the wavelengths of light, have, they're different frequencies of light. The basilar membrane works like a prism for sound. It takes a, a complex sound of, that's made of a mixture of different frequencies and kind of spreads it out over the surface of the membrane so that you can listen to one sound of one frequency or a different sound of a different frequency. So if we visualize the basilar membrane via a spectrogram with these different sounds, we see all sorts of different patterns. In natural settings, sounds emanating from different sources mix and interfere before they reach the ears of a listener. So speech, importantly, occupies more than one band of frequencies, which means that it activates more than one place on the basilar membrane. Different sounds will activate different places on the basilar membrane. So for example, <coughs> here's the dog barking. <coughs> Here's the music. And here's the, the kids playing. Okay, so we've seen how, how the basilar membrane of the ear can decompose sound into component frequencies, and that's one way to spread out sounds. They have different patterns in the basilar membrane, and so they look like different pictures to the low level of the auditory system. And the next stage of, of processing in the auditory pathway decomposes sound into its spatial locations. And this is a really fascinating neural mechanism that I want to tell you about. So we've seen the, the dimension of frequency is extracted by the basilar membrane. Now we're going to try to extract out the dimension of space. And space for the auditory system is pretty tricky. It's not like vision. The visual system is lucky. It gets space, just kind of inherits it from the optics of the eye. Your lens literally projects an image onto your retina in the back of the eye. So that picture is just preserved into your visual cortex. Your visual system doesn't have to do anything special to figure out where things are. It's just sort of handed to it in the image. The auditory system doesn't work that way. The auditory system doesn't have a lens that makes a picture of sound the way we see things with vision. The auditory system has to figure out where things are in space using a very sophisticated mechanism that has to do with comparing the two ears. Okay. Sound, we said, travels at the speed of sound. It's super fast. But it's not infinitely fast. It takes some time. And if sound has to travel a little bit farther, it takes a little bit longer to do that. If you imagine a sound source coming from directly in front of you, the sound waves will leave that source, propagate to your ears. They arrive at your ears at the same time because they travel the same distance, right? But a sound that's off to one side gets to one ear first, and then it gets to the, the other ear a moment later. It's microseconds later. That's almost nothing. I mean, to, to imagine that, I, imagine, you know, when the, when the fighter jet does the demonstration for the air show and it, it flies by at almost the speed of sound, right? it's going really fast. How long do you suppose it would take for it to fly from your right ear to your left ear? It's not very long, right? That's the extra amount of time that the brain uses to figure out where sounds are coming from. It does this using this remarkable circuit uh, that um, 
kind of represents sounds according to the lag between the ears. So you've got one set of neurons in the auditory system that will fire, but only when the sound arrives at the two ears at the same time. Therefore, those neurons convey the signal that's coming from straight ahead. Just off to the side, you've got a set of neurons that will only fire when there's a little bit of a lead in your right ear relative to your left ear. Therefore, those neurons carry the signal that's coming from just off of the midline, a little bit off to the right. Somewhere else, you've got some neurons that are responsive only to sounds that come from way over to the side or way over to the other side. All these neurons are side by side in sort of a, a row, and therefore they make a map of the arrival angles of sound. So a sound that's coming from over here and a sound that's coming from over here activate different sets of neurons in that row. It turns out that those neurons actually also are tuned to frequency. They get that frequency tuning from the basilar membrane because the basilar membrane is feeding the frequency tuning forward to them. So at the level of the midbrain, now we've got this decomposition of sound into spatial dimensions and it's already got the decomposition into the frequency dimension. So we've got two different dimensions in which sounds are separated out. In my lab, we've been working on this problem of simulating with computational models how the auditory system actually does this. And the simulations are, are pretty complicated, but they result in some fascinating, beautiful, but a little strange images. And these are the images that the midbrain is actually computing and sending on to the rest of the auditory system. This is as if we could see what the midbrain sees when it has sound coming from different locations of different frequencies. To get some intuition, we'll listen to that very same tone sweep again. So this is a tone sweep that's located directly in front of you, and you'll see that it moves kind of, kind of symmetrically through the middle of this plot. Okay, so that's, that's a tone sweep. That's a single frequency, right? But of course, speech is going to be super complicated, and it's going to be super fast. So we'll play it at like normal speed and then slow it down so you can actually see the dynamics of, of the surface. In natural settings, sounds emanating from different sources mix and interfere before they reach the ears of a listener. In natural settings, sounds Creepy, emanating eh? from different sources mix and interfere before they reach the ears of a listener. That's what the midbrain is getting, or computing anyway. Here's what happens if you put a different sound at a different location. Subtle, but see if you can see the, the different <coughs> pattern. <coughs> it has a slightly different shape, <coughs> especially at higher frequencies. <coughs> and here's music. Okay, what, what's important about this is that these sounds occupy different regions of the frequency domain and they occupy different spatial locations and the midbrain can see that as different patterns, kind of different images. It's those different images that the cortex is, is given and the cortex can actually make sense of those images now because they're spread out rather than just that one signal, they're actually spread out in two different dimensions. Okay, so we've talked about the, the peripheral auditory system, the inner ear, we've talked about the midbrain and the brainstem. Now we have to talk about the cortex. The cortex is the part of the brain that I've studied the most. It's also the most fabulously complicated part of the brain. And it's a, a very electrically active organ of your body. Of course, different parts of the cortex send signals to each other by exchanging very faint electrical uh, impulses. 
but we can measure those electrical impulses with electroencephalography or, or EEG. In my lab, we have uh, a, an EEG system with 128 sensors that wraps around your head, so it can capture most of the electrical activity of the brain. And we're very interested in looking at how the brain responds particularly to speech. If you look at the electroencephalogram, you'll see these sort of waves in the EEG. That reflects oscillating electrical activity as different parts of the brain communicate with each other. And what's, what we're most interested in is how those oscillations change in response to listening to, to speech. If we actually visualize those oscillations, it makes this sort of storm of electrical activity that you just can't really make sense of. It, it looks sort of like this. We can, however, maximize its expected value. Look, sweetheart, some fool was. We use all sorts of crazy sentences to get these sorts of EEG signals. So this is the, the brain electrical activity. But if we look very carefully at it with, with some sophisticated signal processing techniques, what we find is something remarkable. The electrical oscillations of the brain that are just constantly going all the time, and you've heard of these oscillations before, probably alpha waves and theta waves, delta, gamma, they have different names. They're all of different frequencies. It turns out that some of those oscillations, when you're listening to speech, they actually line up with the words that you're listening to. So whenever there's a word, an oscillation will happen. They lock and phase. It's like, it's like tuning an old AM crystal radio so that the EEG signal, the brain electrical oscillation, actually locks on to the frequency and phase of the voice that you're listening to. If you're listening to two different voices, well, if there's two different voices and you're listening to one of them, your brain will lock onto the one you're listening to and sort of reject the other one. And the better it locks onto that one, the better you can answer questions about what that voice was actually telling you later on. Okay, so, so the brain is locking on with these electrical oscillations, it's locking onto speech, but why? What's the, what's the reason? We think that this reflects something that the cortex can do really well, and that is it makes predictions about what's going to happen next. So what is it doing? We think that the cortex is actually making a prediction about what's the next speech sound that's going to happen. What's the next syllable? And it sends that prediction down through the auditory system to match up with the noisy, messy, difficult to understand raw data that's getting fed forward. It's that matching that we see in EEG when those two signals meet up somewhere probably in primary auditory cortex. Interestingly, we think that the reason that you don't perceive the segmentation problem, you hear a discrete set of words with boundaries in between, but that's not what the acoustic signal is. The reason that you perceive it that way is because you're not actually hearing the sound. You're actually perceiving the predictions. You're listening to your own brain predicting what sounds are coming next, and that's why speech sounds the way it does rather than the way it actually is. Okay, so the cortex seems to be able to track events in time given the spatial decomposition of the midbrain and the frequency decomposition of the, the peripheral nervous system. So that's how the brain works in a nutshell, sort of, more or less. Now we can go back to robots, which is why you came, right? So knowing that this is how the auditory system works, we can now sort of replace these different processing stages with their kind of digital computational software counterparts. We can replace the, the basilar membrane in the inner ear with something called a filter, a filter bank. Uh, all that does is exactly what a basilar membrane does, selectively pull out signals at different frequencies. We can replace the midbrain spatial decomposition uh, section with an algorithm called beamforming. It was actually developed for um, tuning radio telescopes and sonar arrays and that sort of thing. We've adapted it to model the spatial decomposition of, of the midbrain. So we're using this beamforming algorithm. And the cortex, we can model with a new class of artificial neural networks that have been developed for speech recognition called recurrent neural networks. These are, rec these are networks that 
take into account time in their activity patterns. So with this stack of kind of digital tools, we now can implement those functions into software and port it onto a robot. What we'd really like to be able to do, of course, is make a robot that can just understand speech and get around in the world, no problem. It understands everything just exactly the way you do, but that's pretty far off. What we can do for now is to try to implement some very simple behaviors of the robot. Behaviors that are sort of building blocks of more complex auditory awareness. And those sorts of behaviors might include orienting to sounds. So can a robot just follow a conversation? Or can a robot tell its name? If you call to it, does it know that you're calling to it? We can start to take our computational solutions gleaned from the function of the brain and apply them onto a robot. For that, we need a robot. And I want to introduce you to the robot that we work with. It's called iCub. The iCub is a fabulous robot that I had the great privilege to work with when I was on a, s a sabbatical study leave in 2013, 2014. I went to Genoa, Italy for a year. I was sort of the, the neuroscientist embedded in a, a team of roboticists, and it was fantastic. Uh, the iCub is a dedicated research platform for human robot interaction and humanoid assistive robotics. There's about 37, I think there's 38 now, iCubs in the world. They cost about half a million euros each. So they're not like toys, that's for sure. Uh, we have the head of an iCub in my lab, sort of the eyes, ears, and brain, because we're neuroscientists, right? We don't, we don't need the whole body, we just have the head. Um, these are some of my colleagues showing off how the iCub can balance. Uh, you'll notice that it, they're, they're pushing the iCub. So everywhere you see that it has black in this particular iCub, they're different colors, this one's black. Wherever it's black, it has capacitive touch sensors. So it can tell it's being pushed and how hard it's being pushed. And in fact, the, the fingertips are capacitive touch sensors, just like your smartphone screen. So it can tell how hard it's squeezing something. Uh, it has 57 degrees of freedom. That's like roboticist speak for joints. It has 57 joints. Many of them are in the hands. The hands are almost human-like, extremely dexterous. Why? Why would you make a robot with these extremely dexterous hands? F affordances, yes. Because you want this robot to be able to interact with human things. It should be able to pick up cups, right? And pass you a pencil or a fork. It doesn't, it can't do that if it has a gripper like this, right? It needs a hand. So it has a f a fabulous hands. Uh, the eyes are very high quality cameras. Uh, they've done fantastic work with the machine vision in the, in the iCub. When I got there in 2013, they, <laughs> they had a half a million euro robot and the microphones were one euro 50 each. <laughs> That's how much emphasis they had put on sound. So I got there and I said, look, we've got to like, make this robot so that it can hear. And we kind of started with the driver level software, developing the auditory stack as we went along. And it was a lot of code and a lot of work, but now we've got the iCub running software that we develop in my lab and exhibiting some rudimentary auditory awareness. So my colleagues at the Italian Institute of Technology uh, have, they have five iCubs there, six, six now, six iCubs there, it's a fantastic place. But what's great about it is that we have an exchange program with IIT. So in the last four years, I've sent four of my students, undergrads and graduate students, and I have to shout out to the MyTax Global Link program because MyTax paid for two of my students Austin Kothig and Lucas Grass to go and live in Italy for three months each. In fact, Lucas is there right now uh, working directly with, with iCub. You'll see him in a video in just a minute. Uh, IIT also sent a postdoctoral fellow for two different one-month visits to the UofL to work with computer science students in my lab in the neuroscience department teaching them robotics. So we have this really great uh, collaboration between IIT and the UofL that is just getting stronger and stronger. 
so I mentioned that we have the head of an iCub. We develop software for the iCub, and then we push it into this global repository for software for iCub. So iCubs around the world can pull that software, and then all of the iCubs can do what our iCub can do. So we develop the software here, and then push it, and they, they pull it in Italy, and they run it on the iCub, uh, which is a fantastic opportunity for our students here. Okay, let me show you a couple videos of what the iCub can do. Now, I feel like, I, f I, f I mean, I feel like the iCub is just a little kid and, you know, we have to be super patient with it because it doesn't do super complex behaviors yet. It's really hard to make a robot auditory aware, but here's where we're, we're at so far. So here's Lucas and one of the graduate students at IIT just having a conversation, hey, and the iCub's job is to follow the conversation. Oh, fine. I, I went to the cinema to watch Joker. Did you watch it? Yeah, I went and watched it. But it was really interesting, actually, because it was in Italian. So it took a little bit for me to get used to, yeah, what was going on with the characters. But it was really cool seeing the backstory of the Joker and some of the other characters from other Batman movies, such as The Dark Knight Rises. Have you seen any other Batman movies? Oh, uh, no, I likely not. But OK, so. So that's the iCub uh, following a conversation. And like I said, when the, when the iCub turns and looks at you, it makes eye contact, it's like, oh, whoa. <laughs> Even if you wrote the software that makes it do that, it still seems like it's a real thinking person. But it's not. It's just a machine. You have to keep telling it. So there were a few occasions when we'd be working with the iCub, and we'd forget to turn it off. Right? And so it's just like, doo 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 do to do like, like it's one of the following along with the conversation, and we're chatting about what we're gonna do for lunch, and everyone gets up, and then it's like, oh, oh, the iCub, <laughs> we left it. Oh, sorry, iCub. <laughs> okay, the other thing uh, that we're working on right now is, is um, exhibiting awareness of its name, so the iCub can now hear its name, and and yes. it'll turn and wave at hey, you. Hey, Valeria, how are you? How was your weekend? Oh, oh sorry. fine. I R wrong video here. Hey, Valeria, how are you? Oh, hey, Lucas, fine. Hi, Jacob. <laughs> All right, so that's the Jacob. Okay, um, that's where we're at right now, like I said, we're kind of at the very beginning. I want to tell you a little bit about where we're going next. What's next for interactive robotics? In my lab, the next big thing will be speech recognition in crowded, noisy spaces. This is where the kind of the speech recognition that you interact with on your phone, like Siri and Alexa, those things, they work really well, but only if it's otherwise very quiet, right? If, if Siri is like across the room and there's a lot of people talking, it's hopeless, right? We <laughs> I was complaining about Siri in the lab sometime last year and I had my iPad, my iPad was sitting like in my bag across the room and I, and I said something like, oh man, S Siri is so bad, we've got to figure out a better way to, to do that. And Siri on my iPad jumps in and says, I found this on the internet for stomach. Okay. Yes, thank you, Siri. <laughs> That's great. So we're very interested in the problem of speech perception, but in real-world environments where there's lots of different competing noises. So you, then you have to solve the segmentation problem, and you have to solve the cocktail party problem. And my student, Lucas, is working on a kind of a new class of artificial neural networks that can use both frequency and space to solve these problems. And one of the interesting things that we're, we're just starting to dig into is, um, is this kind of iterative process between computer science and neuroscience. So these speech recognition networks that are out there that run on your phone, like Siri and Alexa and Google, and th they're all using a class of neural networks called recurrent neural networks. It's a fairly n new development in neural networks. They work really well, as I said, but here's the funny thing. No one really knows why. We know that they work well. It has something to do with the fact that they're using time. That's the recurrence in the neural networks. They're using time somehow. They do make predictions about what sounds are going to come next, kind of like the cortex. And so it stands to reason that 
the computer scientists that developed these networks stumbled onto some computational principle that the brain also uses. So we want to really try to investigate this from both angles. So the next experiment that we're just planning now is to train neural networks to recognize speech and then have human listeners listening to the same speech and compare the temporal dynamics of the activity within the neural network that we don't understand and within the brain that we don't understand to see if there's some matching dynamics where the, the brain and the neural network are actually doing the same kinds of computations, albeit in very different ways. So that's the next step for us in, the, in, in my lab. But much more broadly, what's the next step for interactive robotics? I get asked all sorts of questions about, about robotics and what you're gonna do. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna start the robot apocalypse? No, <laughs> no, there's no robot, I promise you, there's no robot apocalypse that's about to happen. Um, but robotics is certainly a disruptive technology. And we'll certainly have increasingly autonomous machines. I want to differentiate, though, for a moment between industrial automation and robots. Remember that the kind of robot we're talking about here is something that can make decisions and assist you in the kinds of tasks that you have to do. Uh, that's one thing. Industrial automation doesn't have to be a robot. And industrial automation in general is certainly disruptive and has been since the mid 1700s and will continue to be disruptive, right? The robotics part is, is something else. The kinds of robots that we're developing are what you might call social assistive robots. And in particular, we're very interested in developing robots that can do jobs for people when there aren't other people to do those jobs. We have an aging population and we don't have enough people to take care of them. If we can invent robots that are assistive and can help you do things around the home so that you can stay in your home longer, so that you have a better quality of life into your later years, then that's a success for the kind of robots that we're working with. Okay, will robots make us stupid and lazy? No, robots won't. There's other things that might. <laughs> But <laughs> but I, 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 don't, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's robots. Okay, no matter what the technology does, no matter how it goes, no matter what we haven't even yet imagined for robots, they have to be able to be responsive to us. They exist for a certain reason, and that's to do tasks for us. So we have to be able to communicate with them efficiently, effectively, without really straining. And in order to do that, robots need to be able to hear. I want to leave you with the answer to the question that I posed in the title. How do you talk to your robot? Well, y you all have robots. I said that your car is probably a robot. And you probably can talk to it, but not really in any meaningful way, right? Um, but someday, I think you will have a robot. And you'll tell it what to do. You already have maybe Google or Alexa or Siri, and you have to be able to talk to those. How do you talk to these things that are supposed to be recognizing your speech, but sometimes don't? Well, someday we'll perfect human-like listening for robots. They'll just exhibit auditory awareness just like a person would. You won't have to do anything special. You just tell it things and it will do them. But in the meantime, you have to solve the segmentation problem and the cocktail party problem for your robot or Google or Siri or Alexa. How do you do that? Well, to solve the segmentation problem, it's very much like what you would do if you were speaking to someone who doesn't understand the language very well. Don't speak more loudly. That doesn't help, right? But if you speak, if you pronounce your words very clearly and speak with gaps between the words, then your listener, whether it's a human or a robot, will be able to solve the segmentation problem much more easily. To solve the cocktail party problem requires a bit more brute force because the way these, these um, speech recognition algorithms work right now is they basically just tell you what was the loudest speech in the environment. And so there's two ways you can be the loudest. You can either get really close to the microphones or you can just shout. That actually helps too. And with that, not having to shout at your robot. I'd like to say thanks to all of my students and colleagues here at the U of L, 
and some are still here, some have gone on to do all sorts of fabulous things at other places, and of course my colleagues at the Italian Institute of Technology that make collaboration with the ICUB possible. And thank you very much for listening.